Okay, that was Anton Karras uh, from the Third Man theme song. I'm Randy Critical. This is Randy Critical live on the fly on the Progressive Radio Network. Uh, today we will be looking at the life of uh, Thomas Paine, uh, with the author of the book, Thomas Paine, Promise of America. It's the best book I've ever read about Paine. Harvey J.K., professor at the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay, uh, the author of the book will be uh, joining us in about five or six minutes after we uh, clear up a couple of things uh, that are going on in the city. Um, first of all, coming up this Saturday in New York City on the 28th, there will be a demonstration, a rally, a vigil, some kind of direct action, all of it combined uh, at uh, two o'clock. Now it's being sponsored by New York City Free Assange and it's at Washington Square Park, uh, right there in the middle by the beautiful new fountain from two to four o'clock and uh, Chuck and Bernadette and all the others uh, will be there along with uh, Rogers Army uh, musician, Chris Borg. So that's this Saturday, Bianca will be there with me as well. Uh, that's 2 p.m. Washington Square Park at a New York uh, Free Assange vigil slash rally. Um, also coming up, October 1st is the sentencing of the gentleman we had on last week along with Roger Waters, and that is Steve Donziger on October 1st. I will be there for that. Uh, that's at, at eight o'clock in the morning. It's really important that you get there. Trust me, get there at eight o'clock in the morning at the federal courthouse uh, in lower Manhattan at 8 a.m. It's October 1st, and uh, it's 500 Pearl Street, by the way. And uh, that's for Steve Donziger facing six months in jail, another two years of house arrest. This affects all of us, folks. It is critical that you get there. We need to have a big crowd. And uh, you can find out more by going to DonzigerDefense.com. That's D-O-N-Z-I-G-E-R Defense.com. And make a contribution uh, but uh, make a contribution of your body as well on October 1st, okay? Uh, this is a very, very, um, uh, you know, scary prospect, him going to jail for six months. I mean, it's, 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 it's Kafka-esque. Uh, what I want to play right now, because all of these cases, Don Ziger, uh, what's happening to him, what ha what's happening to Julian Assange, what just happened to Craig Murray, and many others. Bill Kunstler talked about this way back after the Chicago 7 trial. And I, I wanna play what he played right now. This is Bill Kunstler. This is from a documentary called Disturbing the Universe by Emily and Sarah Kunstler. Now this is, this, he's talking about Don Ziger here. He's talking about Assange and he's talking about Craig Murray. Listen to this and we'll be right back afterwards. And that's the terrible myth of organized society. That everything that's done through the established system is legal and that word has a powerful psychological impact it makes people believe that there is an order to life and an order to a system and that a person that goes through this order and is convicted has gotten all that is due him and therefore society can turn its conscience off and look to other things and other times. And that's the terrible thing about these past trials, is that they have this aura of legitimacy, this aura of legality. I suspect that better men than the world has known, and more of them, have gone to their death through a legal system than through all the illegalities in the history of man. Six million people in Europe during the Third Reich, legal. Sacco Vanzetti, quite legal. The Haymarket defendants, legal. The hundreds of rape trials throughout the South where black men were condemned to death, all legal. Jesus, legal. Socrates, legal. And that is the kaleidoscopic nature of what we live through here 
and in other places. Because all tyrants learn that it is far better to do this thing through some semblance of legality than to do it without that pretense. Okay, so there you go. All right, that's what's happening to Steve Donziger. It's happening to Julian Assange. It happened to Craig Murray. Don't let it happen, folks. Get involved. Be there October 1st if you are in New York City at Federal Plaza. All right, um, I think that's about it. We're going to go right now uh, and play before we get into this interview with my dear friend, uh, Professor uh, Harvey J.K. Uh, we're going to play a tune called Dancing to Tom Paine's Bones. All right, we're going to play that and come back with the great professor. Don't go away. As I roved out one evening by a river of discontent, I chanced to meet with old Tom Paine as a running down the road he went. Said I can't stop right now, child. King George is after me. Have a rope around my throat and hang me from the Liberty Tree. But I will dance to Tom Paine's bones. Dance to Tom Paine's bones. Dance to the oldest boots I own. To the rhythm of Tom Paine's bones. I will dance to Tom Paine's bones. Dance to Tom Paine's bones. Dance to the oldest boots I own. To the rhythm of Tom Paine's bones. Okay, that was. Um... Tom Paine's Bones, one version. Um, I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical, live on the fly here on internationally acclaimed Progressive Radio Network. Uh, and uh, as I said, we are joined today, and I gave you, Professor, a glorious introduction, which you well deserve, as does Tom Paine, the introduction. Thomas Paine, that was Thomas Paine's Bones, dancing to Thomas Paine's bones. Professor, what does that mean? Well, first, can I say thank you for having me on? It's good to see you again, Randy. <laughs> yes. Well, let me just tell you this before you say that. We did a four-part series, folks, uh, last year. I thought we'd get done in one, but there's so much to Thomas Paine. There was so much we just went from week to week to week to week, and we got about five hours in, and we could have done more. Uh, but it's all based on this beautiful book, as I mentioned, uh, Promise of America, Thomas Paine by the great Professor Harvey J. K. There, there's your introduction. Okay, thank you. But you, you asked me about basically why Thomas Paine, I think we, we could reduce it to? Well, no, Thomas Paine's bones to begin with. That's why something. Thomas Paine's bones? Why do they sing about them? Well, they sing about them because while Thomas Paine died in New York City, he couldn't find a burial place in New York City. So he was buried up in New Rochelle, New York, on the property of a little cottage and land that New York State gave him after the Revolutionary War to recognize his contribution. But, but his bones did not stay there. There was an Englishman named William Cobbett. And Cobbett, when he first came to America in the 1790s, was a reactionary, is the best way I can put it. And what he did is he basically scorned Thomas Paine, who at that time was not even in the United States. He was over in France, involved in the French Revolution. When Cobbett went back to England, thinking himself a good British Tory, he discovered how misguided his own mind and politics were. And he became, for lack of a better way of putting it, something of a radical in England. And he made a trip back to the United States. And when he came back, he decided, he, he swore that he was going to take Thomas Paine's bones with him back to England so he could raise money to build a monument to Thomas Paine in England. So uh, the story, depend, depending on who, you, who whose version you read, he either went in broad daylight or in the dark of night, he dug up the coffin sort of quickly took it by by cart, by, you know, wagon and, and horse down to New York Harbor to get it on a boat and off to England it went. And I can tell you that I used to like the, the idea that he never made it to England, that actually Payne's bones fell off the ship mid-Atlantic because it would be a recognition of Payne's role in the American Revolution, the British Democratic and labor movements, 
and the French Revolution. But indeed, it turns out he did get back to England with those bones. Now, the problem was that he had a very hard time raising the money that he wanted because he really wanted to build a significant monument to pain. And he died. And in fact, his the, the coffin was apparently in a barn somewhere outside of Manchester. His, I think he had a son who may have been responsible, but that the barn burned and thus his bones were lost. And there are people who lay claim to parts of his his anatomy, kind of like, you know, in the Catholic Church, they have what are those things called? The, uh, the, the, the Shroud of Turin. Yeah, those kinds of things. That's so right. there are people, you know, who said they had the hair of Thomas Paine. And, right. and there's even one woman in Australia who I have very little, I have, I believe me, she's not, not a friend at all. She claims she has Thomas Paine's skull. So oh. uh, anyhow, I like to still think of him as somehow maybe mid-Atlantic, the Atlantic revolutionary, the revolutionary Democrat of the modern age. Now that is a, a most incredible tale. It, it's very similar to that of Avita Perón, who uh, body was shifted around for five or six years or seven years and ended up uh, in the Cimitario Recoleta. But uh, the military, the coup leaders did not want her out there. And so they moved her around and I think she's back now. But uh, Thomas Paine. Now, so we know we, we started out with the bones of Thomas Paine. Now I want to go back to the beginning uh, as those bones were developing in England. And let's go right up uh, to his uh, journeyman uh, as a craftsman and uh, his uh, move to America. Uh, why yeah, don't we I, go there? Yeah. So uh, to keep the, the early st stuff short, because you and I covered it at length a year yes, ago. Yes. Um, it is. A, he was born to a. Uh, um, you know, humble family, you might say, uh, an artisan family. His father was a stay maker, which is essentially a corset maker. His mother was uh, actually came from a well, not a well, not a rich family, but a, a comfortable family. But together, they, it was a hard time because an artisan's life was tough. And especially in the 18th century. Well, anyhow, Payne had several years of schooling, thanks to an aunt who gave his family money. But in around 13, his father and mother couldn't afford to keep him in school. They pulled him out and they apprenticed him to his own father to learn corset making. And he did that for several years. But, you know, like any any young man of his of his, you know, of his sort, he, he wanted adventure. He wanted to strike out on his own. So he ran away. And first of all, he served aboard a privateer, not a pirate ship, but a privateer, which is a licensed ship by the crown that would go out and prey on enemy shipping. And when he came back from a year at sea, he thought he'd had enough between the devil and the deep blue sea. In fact, he settled in London because he was he wanted to learn more. And he spent a good deal. He spent almost a year in London spending time at lectures in taverns and coffee shops where there were discussions among the artisans who were very a self-educated class of working people and then he and then he saw he had to make a living so he tried once again to to become a stay maker and it was not it was not very successful and he he and the woman he just whom he met and fell in love with um had a ch had a child on the way and they moved from one town to another and tragically Payne lost his wife and child in childbirth at which time he went back to his his hometown in North in, in Norfolk, England, and he studied to take the test for the excise officers exam. He actually became a, a customs officer in the British, you know, British excise yeah. officer. Wow. And he did that, you know, off and on because he kept, you know, it was he, he was actually accused of, of cheating as an officer of, you know, taking a bribe. He, he was thrown out and then he was restored, which means probably it wasn't true. Um, and eventually he settles on the south of England working as an excise officer. And there at the White Hart Tavern, he and other men of his sort uh, would meet a couple of times a week in the Headstrong Company. And they would eat and drink and debate politics, both British politics and probably the politics of colonial America. And his fellow excise officers, who were a very poorly paid lot, chose him to represent him, for him to represent them, I mean, in, by, in a petition drive to Parliament and the Excise Commission to ask for a raise, which, by the way, was illegal. All forms of labor combinations, as, as they called it, were illegal. And really? so pay, government or private? Any form of labor organizing was illegal. Throughout. OK. OK. And so after a period of after maybe you know months having left his post behind, getting it covered by someone else, 
Um, he was discovered to be basically pursuing the wrong kinds of activities in London and the Excise Commission fired him or sacked him, they would say in England. And it was at that point that he turned to a man, the most important figure in the Atlantic world at the time who was residing in London, representing the colonies, you might say. He turned to Ben Franklin and wondered aloud to Franklin, should I consider emigrating to America? And Franklin, who was eager to recruit the best possible gentlemen to go off to America, both for the sake of American development and also possibly for the sake of a brewing, well, it was already underway, the rebellion. He goes, to, he, co he goes from England to America in the fall of 1774, arrives in Philadelphia and is immediately, having been literally, you know, his idea of England was a terrible place of religious persecution, of terrible inequality and poverty, of a government that was corrupt, and took out its corruption on its own workers. I mean, it was, it was a, not a good set of memories he had of, of England. And he arrives in America, hoping to start over, and he immediately falls in love with what he discovers in Philadelphia. A very diverse population, far more freedom of worship than anything that existed back in England. And, you know, he, he was shocked by the slavery, but was amazed at the, the fact that, and also the indentured servitude that existed in Philadelphia. But he was really also astounded by the relative absence of poverty, relative absence of poverty. Can I, can I just back up? I mean, he he didn't take a tour of, of where slavery was prominent, even though it was still in the U.S. in, in New York. Right. City. In, 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 but Philadelphia had a slave market of its own. It did it really? OK, yeah. I did not know that. I know that Ben Franklin and he, from what I remember, uh, were the founders of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. Yeah, there was this group of men and Payne was involved. In fact, Payne's first really political essay in America, where having come to America, he actually gets a job as the editor of a new magazine, in good part because he has an introduction from Ben Franklin that he could carry with him to introduce himself to people. Pennsylvania when, Magazine. The right? Pennsylvania Magazine, exactly. Yeah. And his, his first really, and by the way, he turned it into the most important magazine in the colonies, and which, which is amazing given it was not at all what, he, what his background was at all, but he had a talent. There were others, from what I read in your book, there were other magazines, but they all went belly up. Uh, but he was able to do something with this Pennsylvania magazine. Yeah, well, it was in Philadelphia. There was a lot of exciting stuff going on in Philadelphia. He wrote, far, I mean, it was significant. He's almost middle-aged. He had done only a little bit of writing for, on behalf of the excise officers, but what he wrote was really quite significant. And the first political essay before any of the others were political was a call for the end of slavery in the American colonies. African slavery in America. Right, right, exactly. Well, not long after that appeared, there occurred the battles of Lexington Concord up in Massachusetts. And that those two battles turned Thomas Paine into a patriot. He was now committed to the American struggle. The problem was the American struggle was well underway. Washington had an army that he was taking up to New England. The problem, but the point is no one really knew what the struggle was about other than the Americans wanted the British to treat them like British subjects with certain kinds of rights that Britishers back in England had. Now, admittedly, they weren't the kind of rights that would might readily impress us, but England was in its own way a land of liberty far more than any other European country. And the Americans were asking for no legislation without representation, or as the popular rendition goes, no taxation without representation. But it really had to do with, we're not represented in parliament. You should not, uh, we should not be subject to the laws enacted by parliament. We have our own assemblies. Now they, in the course of that year of 1775, and it had begun earlier, they threw out British authorities from towns and cities. They literally rose up and threw out the authorities and organized committees to set, to regulate life in these towns and cities. This was an anarchist dream. Right. You mean in the throughout, sense that the, throughout the Northeast, they were doing that. All yeah. the way, sorry, they did this from New England all the way down to the Southern colonies. Okay. Throughout, okay. The only thing was, again, no one knew what the struggle was ultimately going to be about. Pain, however, was encouraged by one or more members of the Continental Congress especially a man named Benjamin Rush, a doctor. Right. Rush encouraged him to write a pamphlet 
emphasizing the possibility, emphasizing the possibility of the American colonies separating from Britain. Okay, well, can I, can I just hold it there. I just want to get this in. Yeah. This, as you say, there was no unifying uh, centrifugal force there, if you will, uh, to drive everyone to rebel. Is that is that what? Well, you're there. Here, here's the thing. There, the, the, what happened? It's there. Obviously, was a sense of what it, there was a sense that the colonists were all Americans. So, so if if something occurred in New England. As, as in the case of the, tea, the Boston Tea Party, the British applying tremendous pressure and sending in troops to occupy Boston. The Boston if Master all of these Trump. things are underway, then other colonists, and th there, was the, there were the committees of correspondence, there were Sons of Liberty who kept up a regular contact between the colonies. And basically the Americans gathered around this idea of no legislation without representation. They wanted the rights that any freeborn Englishman would have. But Paine realized that these Americans had it in their power, and this is Paine's own words, to begin the world over again. So when he set himself down to write this pamphlet that Benjamin Rush had tried to encourage him to write, Paine went far beyond anything anyone had imagined in the American colonies. And what he and he starts off the pamphlet itself. This is the pamphlet that every school child learns it, along the way somewhere. Common sense. And in this pamphlet, he doesn't talk right away about separating from England. The first thing he does is he lays out the degree to which human beings are socially, instinctively sociable, and instinctively democratic with a small d. That 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 is as their settlements grow, he says. Folks in these new settlements in America found it necessary to gather together. And he actually says under under a big tree, the oak tree, and deliberate and decide on rules and laws of their own. Now, this is the 47th offers a, page pamphlet called Common Sense. Right. right. In this pamphlet, he first emphasizes the possibility of democracy. Secondly, he lambastes British government, lambastes British government as corrupt, as authoritarian, and ultimately as something that neither history nor the Bible nor reason would ever accept. In other words, people had been subjected to royal and aristocratic rule, which is essentially against human nature, number one, against all the evidence of history that monarchs bring wars and devastation, and, and aristocrats are living off the fat of the land, you might say. So what Paine does is he first rem he forces Americans in these early parts of the pamphlet, it's only 50 pages, the pamphlet, he forces Americans to recognize what's really at stake in their rebellion. And he then turns to, the, to the, his argument to two things, the importance of separating from Britain that is, that American colonists, as different as they may be, ethnically and religiously diverse, and as much as they are diverse regarding the, you know, the New Englanders, the Middle Atlantic folks, and the Southerners, that they are all fundamentally American. And as Americans, they really do have it in their power to do something historically unprecedented. That is, create a democratic republic. And he lays out a plan for a democratic constitution and really sort of a bill of rights. It's all in the pamphlet. It's an amazing pamphlet. People should read it. Well, he was Definitely more of his life. Let it. me ask you, could you just talk about African uh, slavery, African-American slavery in America, uh, his uh, first monograph. Uh, this, well, this, this is a, an article. He, he, it's an article he wrote. An article. All right. This is not in the Pennsylvania Magazine. This he actually wrote, actually, strangely enough, he wrote it for a different, a different newspaper, like another really? newspaper. Yeah, really yeah. there are some who aren't sure he wrote it, but it makes sense if you understand his views of inequality and slavery. OK, no, I, uh, the reason why I bring it up is because I'm, we've had, people want to hear our entire conversation or five part conversation. Go to randycritical.com and go back to last year, the, a four part series yeah. with you. So I, I just one point I didn't make back then is the. Uh, here he's got Common Sense, which is the most popular book 
proportionally to any book in American history, I believe, right? Well, at least as, you know, maybe up until Uncle Tom's Cabin or the Bible. The Bible outsells everything, of course. Okay. But Common Sense sold in its, it, that spring, there were 120,000 copies distributed. The population of the colonies in total was 3 million, 500,000 of whom were African Americans. The majority, overwhelming majority of those folks were black. Uh, I was obviously, I mean, sorry, were slaves, I should say right. that. And black. So, so what happens is it becomes this unpre, you know, it's like an, a spectacular success. But uh, please understand, he didn't take any royalties for it. Not a nickel. Did he put his name on there? Well, in the early editions, no. He came to be known himself as Common Sense. He that was his nickname now, Common Sense. Mm -hmm. Nobody put their names on on political pamphlets in those days. Nobody. Were they looking for him when that came out, British authorities? Well, the British authorities were pretty much out of the picture by this time. The rebellion has already literally reduced the British authorities to a very marginal role. Right. But he knew damn well that if the British could get their hands on him, he was in trouble. He knew that. That was true for so much of his life because later, just to let people know, he gets deeply involved in the French Revolution and was afraid to get on a ship and return to America because if the British caught him, they, he knew they'd hang him. They actually tried, they actually held a trial in England. Right, in absentia. In, yeah, that he, they charged him with sedition. That's because he wrote uh, Rights, Rights of, of Man. Man. Right. Yeah. In, in, uh, in, in response to Edmund Burke's uh, reflections book. on the revolution in France. Right, That's right. right. So they were all afraid of revolution spreading. Throughout. Thomas Paine really was the prophet of revolution in the 18th century. Right. Really was the, the, the greatest radical of a revolutionary age. All right. Now, and not only that, he was the greatest thinker by far of all the people that were involved in, in, in the American Revolution. I mean, I have a lot of. Uh, of doubts about the, the motives of some of these uh, people that rose to the top. Oh, sure. Washington, Jefferson, Adams. I'm not a big fan of those. I actually like Aaron Byrd. I tell you why some other time because he was he was anti-slavery <laughs> and he was really good with women. He was for suffrage way back in 17. He was Mary <laughs> Wollstonecraft's best friend. Now forget about him. Thomas Paine was Wollstonecraft's friend as well. They both. Oh, he was the, he was at the center of this cohort of British and American radicals in Paris, because he was the famous author of Common Sense. So, oh, really? So, but he, oh, yeah. he went to Paris. He went to Paris not until like- That's not until late, so that's really not until the late 1780s. he escapes from the British authorities after he writes, yeah. writes a man. And he's, and he's actually voted into Somehow he gets into the parliament. Or right, they elect him to the assembly, National assembly, assembly, right. National Assembly. Well, he was with the conservative branch of the uh, Jacobins, right? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's, there were two, two prominent groups among the revolutionaries. One was the Girondins and right. one was the Jacobins. Yes. In the revolution, they were both groups of radicals. Right. No, I, yes. Okay. The right. Girondins were often not quite as as murderous is a good way of putting it as the Jacobins. I mean, the Jacobins were ready to take off people's heads more readily than the Girondin. But here's the thing. It's likely that Payne was aligned with the Girondin at the beginning because more of them could speak English. Right. Payne so couldn't was, speak French. So he was friends with Danton. Not Danton, right. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. We're jumping ahead. And that's such a fascinating period of, of his life. In between, he also was trying to sell uh, suspension bridges, I believe. No, not it, what. Here's what. <laughs> what happened was Payne always had a fascination for science and technology. Even during the war, he and Washington would run it would some occasionally run experiments together. OK, during the Revolutionary War. Well, during the Revolutionary War, Payne continued to write pamphlets to support the struggle. And these pamphlets were called the crisis papers. Right. And the most wait, famous wait, wait, one of years. those is wait a second. The American crisis. Give us the years that started in, in, in the initial. Okay, so let's remember in January 1776, common sense appears. Right. And Payne himself enters into the, and then in July, of course, the Declaration of Independence. Payne joins a Philadelphia militia and serves for, for a while in that militia. But then he, is, he transfers to Washington's own camp. 
Nathaniel Green was the general. And he is, he is with Washington as they retreat across New Jersey from Fort Lee to Philadelphia. And when, along the way, Washington says to him, I think you need to write a new pamphlet. A pamphlet oh, really? to- Oh I yeah, because that. remember, the, the British were kicking the shit out of the American, the American army. And yeah. Washington knew, he told everyone, if we, get, if we get one more strike from the British that we suffered in New York, it's all over. So he said to Payne, we, we need him, I'm paraphrasing, who knows what the exact words were. He said to Payne, we need a morale booster. You've got to unify the army. You've got to inspire the troops not to abandon us. Tr troops were just abandoning the army as right. they came across a wintry New Jersey. It was terrible. So Payne begins to write, and the famous line is, these are the times that try men's souls, which is possibly one of the. Is that the opening line? That's in the, the first of the crisis papers. It's the opening line. It's a great paragraph so, that he goes on to write. And then he says to Washington, I, I need to finish the pamphlet and get it printed. And Washington gives him leave from from the from the army at that moment. And he rushes off on horseback to Philadelphia while Washington's army crosses north of Philadelphia to try to get themselves together. While they're separate, while Payne is in Philadelphia and Washington and the army are north of Philadelphia, Payne finishes and gets it printed and sends, they must send a, a number of boxes or crates of it to Washington. Washington distributes oh, whoa, 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 it. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, no, wait, let me finish. Hold on. To this. Washington. Let me ask this one question. How, yeah. how long did it take him to write the first one before he sends it? Well, this pamphlet is, is short. I mean, it's several, it's not a very big pamphlet, it's short. But, he, but Payne never writes fast. He always takes his time, okay? So this is now, De this is now December of 76. And Washington sees the pamphlet and he immediately orders it distributed to all of his officers Whoa. and commands that all of the men, sorry, all the officers who are men, that before they get in the boats to cross the Delaware to attack Trenton and the Hessian army, that the officers should read this pamphlet aloud to the troops. And it's said that the line goes like this, a poet wrote this during the revolution. Without the pen of pain, Washington's sword would have been wielded in vain. Wow. And this is and so throughout the revolution, whenever morale is low, whenever they may well get, you know, like it's the final blow, Payne will write these kinds of things. And believe it or not, it's the kind of words that really did instill a new kind of, you know, vigor in the in the men's uh, capacity to fight. It's really amazing. I, you know, I, I want to just get back to that first pamphlet, the term that I use a lot for people that get involved in street demonstrations, vigils and direct action, what I call uh, the winter soldiers. So uh, right. talk, where the summer soldier versus the winter soldier, the sunshine, shine, soldier. sunshine, patriot and right. the summer soldier. Is that in there? G give us an overview. That's in that. Yes, it's in that pamphlet. His point is that real, real patriots will now turn out all the more. OK, he even calls on women to turn out for the revolution. OK, yes. And so here's the thing. And to jump ahead, and I know you'll appreciate this. So in during the Vietnam War, an organization of Vietnam veterans against the war, basically, they call themselves the Winter Soldiers. Yes. Because okay? they fought not in summertime to, to bring an end to the war. They would turn out at all times to try to bring an end to the Vietnam War. Right. OK, so I use that term a lot, you know, uh, to get people out. Uh, those who uh, like those. I remember uh, the uh, Vietnam vets that showed up, uh, but uh, others use it and, and they pervert it. And we're talking about Reagan, I think, used a uh, pain. And so did the Giuliani's got a show called. Uh, yeah, but you know what? I don't know about Nixon, but I can tell you this. The, 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 the irony is the first American president after Roosevelt to you really use pain was Ronald Reagan. Yes. What did he say? One he actually I grabbed hold of Payne's most radical words. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. Reagan was brilliant. 
This was in he did it a number of times, but most famously in his acceptance speech in 1980 of the Republican nomination for president. He quoted three figures from American history who were heroes of the left. And he did right. this. One was Payne. The next was Lincoln. And the next was Franklin Roosevelt. Right. OK. So, yeah. yeah. But he didn't really. I mean, what he used those words. To he used the words. Echo? He I used mean, the words he, completely out of context. Look, but he but his very but by using them, he really he actually scared conservatives. George Will, the most famous conservative columnist in America, actually chastised Reagan for doing that. He said, wait a second. A conservative is not supposed to quote Thomas Paine. He's supposed to quote Edmund Burke. Will right. was worried about what Reagan might do, because if he's going to quote the likes of Thomas Paine and Franklin Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln, he might have been a, a progressive in, 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 you know, in conservative clothing. But don't forget, Reagan himself began politically in the 30s and the 40s as an FDR Democrat. Right, right. And, 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 and FDR was a, a big supporter. Mark Twain, we can get hopefully we have time to talk about those who were influenced. I want to get back to. Uh, yeah, I was just American looking over to the crisis. clock because I know we're on the American clock, so. crisis. Um, we got time. American crisis. After that, uh, he doesn't make any money during this period of time. Uh, he's not heralded. Well, he does. Some, he does. He, he serves as the, the secretary of the Committee of Foreign Affairs of the Congress. He becomes a whistleblower. Tell us about that. OK, so he's the secretary of the Committee of Foreign Affairs, which handles all the correspondence for the American government during the revolution. And one of the most significant elements, uh, um, you know, sorry, not elements. One of the most significant sets of files he's keeping are the files that has to do with the secret negotiations with France for France to give aid to the Americans against the British. And the French were giving aid to the Americans before they ever had any kind of formal alliance. Now, this, these negotiations were conducted by American agents in Paris, one of whom's name was Silas Dean. And Silas Dean was a friend of the most elite people in the Congress, like, you know, uh, Governor Morris, who was a wealthy planter, not planter, a uh, lawyer and merchant. And Folks a like that. He was a reactionary. That, Right. And all the, and these guys, these guys did not care for P Thomas Paine to begin with because they all thought it was OK for Paine to call for independence. But they hated the fact that common sense called for democracy that they didn't like too much. Okay? And does that include John Adams? Well, Adams. Yeah, it does. Adams hated aristocrats, but he didn't trust the people. He would always say that the rabble basically considered. But his wife. Tell us about his wife, Abigail. Well, wait, did you want me to tell the, the whistleblower story or the yes. Adams story? Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Tell me the, yes. So and Silas then. Dean, Payne discovers in correspondence, basically, and he's doing some math, he discovers that Silas Dean is embezzling money, that the money that France is giving for weapons and stuff, that he, he comes to believe that Silas Dean is cheating his own government, the American government. And Payne comes out and announces it. He, he, he you know, he, uh, he charges Silas Dean with this action. Well, here's the, pro that in itself was, a, you know, we'd say, well, that's wonderful. However, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Silas Dean was the friend of all these very elite conservative members of Congress. And making it worse is, when Payne revealed Silas Dean's corruption, what he was, he gave away the fact that France was aiding America off the record. So they, so the likes of Governor Morris and others could accuse Payne of basically revealing seat, you know, state secrets. Right. So they didn't arrest him or anything like that, but they fired him. They pushed him out of the, out of the government. And he, he then made his, a living through various means during the revolution. But he never stopped writing the pamphlets, the crisis papers. And Washington and Payne were friends. And Jefferson was a friend. There were those who stayed close to Payne. But, but, Jefferson would never, never turn his back on Payne. I, I, because they were intellectuals, at least uh, 
Jefferson was. I mean, the contradiction is a slave owner. I don't know how he was able to gloss over it, uh, uh, Payne. Maybe he thought that these guys will evolve, uh, but um, so he goes on. Payne's first commitment was to see an independent United States. Yes. And he always wanted to get rid of slavery. He was yeah. not invited to participate in the drafting of the Constitution. Neither the, well, the, in the case of the Declaration, he wasn't asked to participate, but it's very clear the degree to which he influenced it. In the case of the Constitution, we should remember that Adams was ambassador to England at that time, Jefferson was ambassador to France, and Payne is already in France with the Revolution. So during the years of, say, 17, ooh, what year, 1789, 89. in that stretch, Jefferson and Payne were very close in Paris. And they would comment on the drafts of the Constitution when they would get together in, Paris, in, in Jefferson's residence, the ambassadorial residence. So, but then Jefferson come back, comes back to the United States Payne stays on involved in the revolution. This is the thing that's interesting. Jefferson wanted Payne to come back to America because he, he knew that the Federalists, the likes of Adams and Hamilton, Adams became vice president, Hamilton was secretary of the treasury. Jefferson wanted Payne's radical voice and pen in America to, to basically to go after the conservative Federalists. So Jefferson tried to get Payne the job of Postmaster General. But the, and, but, but the rest of the cabinet wouldn't go along. And, and in any case, Payne stayed on in France. He, Payne doesn't come back to the United States until 1801, I think it is. Yeah. He almost lost his life there. That I mean, there's so much yes. to talk about. We still have age of reason to talk about. Uh, and, and maybe rights of man is what turns him. He's there's a warrant for his arrest. As you say, they try him at absentia. He goes to Paris. He gets involved with the revolution. Let's, let's get to that right now. And his okay, right, in there, Rights of Men, this is important. In Rights of Men, which is, a, which is two pamphlets to get together, essentially almost make a book. In this, he repeats his arguments from common sense about democracy. And he, and he uses the United States as proof that the Europeans, the British and the French can make a democracy too. That's his argument, okay? However, here's what happens. The, the Jacobins take power in the revolution and right. they start executing the Girondins, their former comrades who are now have become a separate party. They're getting executed. Thomas Paine is in the assembly when the question comes up about what to do with the king who had tried to escape from Paris. Right. Yes. And the Jacobins wanted, they wanted a quick trial in the assembly and then the beheading, the guillotine. Payne always opposed capital punishment. He opposed it. And he, st and he stood up in, and spoke in English in the assembly saying we should not execute the king. We should re-educate the king and his family by sending them to America. Payne, keep in mind, Payne knew that the, independence of the United States had depended on that French king, his willingness to send an army and navy to assist the revolution. Without it, also, there would have been a revolution, most likely, without Louis XVI. Yeah, fighting there, it. there would have been a revolution, but would there have finally been a successful revolution? That's the question. When those boats showed up in, 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 the, in the New York Harbor, those boats from those war boats that I believe uh, France sent over here. No, no, no. You're confusing your 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 fleets. Yes. You're con you're confusing your fleets. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to edit that out and make sure. <laughs> yes, that you I'm will. Like a scholar. So <laughs> when they send their fleets over here, whatever city, they uh, sent an uh, army. They send an army. I know, but didn't they? they send keep in mind, the British Navy was the most powerful navy. Yes. Always. However, there was a point where the the French Navy and the French Army with the American forces. Bas that's at Yorktown. Basically, the gig is up for the British. But this is the thing. Th this is the thing that's important in all of this. Payne opposed capital punishment. And when he was standing in the assembly and insisting that we they not execute the king, the Jacobins decided it was time to get rid of Payne. Even though he wasn't a French citizen. 
He, he was an honorary French citizen. And so he gets tried. Well, they arrest him. Office they arrest of Public him. Safety. Office of Public Safety. They arrest so, him and they throw him in prison. Did he go before a trial? Because usually they went. Well, it might have been a summary window. trial. They didn't have yeah. a, there was no serious trial. No. Not for him, but there were no. for others. Okay. Yeah. So th what they do is, what they and they basically, they want to, they get execute him. Right. So here's, here's what happens. It's a, it's a, by accident that he lives. He, be, he becomes ill in the cell. There are three men in the cell. Two of them, I, I think one of them is from Belgium. The other one might be Danish. And he's, of course, he, sa he says, look, I'm an American. You've got to let, let me out of here. But remember the name Governor Morris, the guy who hated him back in the Continental Congress and the Independent American Congress. He's now the ambassador to France. Oh, no. <laughs> and he tells the French. I mean, Governor Morris hated the Jacobins, but he, that shows you how much he hated pain. He oh. told the Jacobins he's not an American. He's British. Well, that oh. doesn't help his case at all. So that he's marked for execution. However, he's ill in the cell. The cell has two doors, an outer door and an inner door. The inner door is the actual sort of door that lets air in or out. So when you, if you need air, you open the outer door. Right. So that night, the executioner's man comes by, marks the doors of those prisoners to be executed. However, the two men in the cell with him convince another guard to leave the outer door open in order to let pain have air because he's ill. What happens is in the morning when they come around to collect the prisoners to be executed, that door is still open up against the wall. So the mark on the door, they don't see it because it's, uh, it's turned to the wall. That's a true story? Yes. Oh my God. So he escapes the execution. He escapes the execution and the ambassadorship changes. James Monroe becomes the ambassador. Oh, really? He had always, as a young man, he had been a, he had been a, a fan, you might say, to use our words, of Thomas Paine. How did he, he find had, out about him, though? How did people find out? Uh, everyone knew Paine was, I mean, they knew he was in prison. Right. And the guy was famous. Right. I mean, it's probably, after Franklin, he might have been one of the most famous people in the Atlantic oh, world. That was a stupid question. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, so anyhow, well, no need to apologize. Paine... Payne is gets released from prison because James Monroe says, look, this is an American. You have no right to keep him, not to mention the fact that he's the great revolutionary. you got to be crazy. And also the Jacobins get pushed out of power as well. Right. So it makes it easier to. to release. But Payne does not return to America. He is still absolutely afraid of the possibility that the British Navy will capture him, which will lead to his execution. So he stays in France for several years now. At that time, he writes Age of Reason, <laughs> which is his attack on organized religion. But I want to make it clear to people, Paine is not an atheist. He's a deist. Deist. Tell us what a deist is for those who don't know. I know. but A deist believes in God, the creator. Right. But not God, the interferer. Right. And a lot of those founding fathers were deists. They were also deists, but they kept it quiet. Okay. Pain becomes pain because what? it's heretical. It's almost heretical. Jefferson was a deist. Washington was a deist. Th th those two names alone should tell you yes. how widespread it was. But Washington didn't, didn't go around telling people. What it is is at first is they rejected the Trinity. Right. And then of course they believed in a singular God, but a God who was a creator. And 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 at this point, if you asked a deist. Well, where were where was God then? He'd, they'd say he's he's off creating new worlds. I see. Okay. So here, so here's what. So Payne, Payne writes this pamphlet. Now it's a defense of the existence of God, but an attack on organized religion. Yes. Okay. This this becomes a weapon against him by the conservatives in America. Yes. But Jefferson continues and others known as the Democratic Republicans, they continue to see Payne as as a champion in, in, as a, in terms of political philosophy and ideas. So Payne writes another pamphlet while he's still in France. This pamphlet is the 
if you like, it's in many ways the opening text or document of what we call social democracy. This pamphlet is called Agrarian Justice. Yes, that's what I want you to talk about now. In this pamphlet, Payne says, look, God created the earth for all of us to share. So if there are men who are monopolizing the land, they owe us payments. They, don't, they need to pay us a tax for the land that they are occupying. Guaranteed and, wage. No, no. Don't, don't, don't go Andrew Yang on me, okay? Okay, no, that's what you're saying. Oh, I don't believe me. I don't go Andrew <laughs> Okay. What Payne says is this. The landowners who are monopolizing the land should pay a tax or a tithe or a fee into a, into a national trust. The monies that go in there should be used for two purposes. One of which is the beginnings of what we would call social security. That is, he says, people when they reach a certain age should no longer have to work. The monies paid by these landowners should go to providing payments, pensions to the elderly. And he was a feminist enough to say men and women, okay? Should not have to work. Agrarian reform. Agrarian yes. justice. Agrarian justice. Uh, that, now, the, not agrarian reform. He imagined the fund would be big. So he said it should also do something else. Young people, when they reach the age of maturity, should be given a sum of money to buy land, open a business, or get an education, whatever they want to use it for. And he said this, was, this was, should be for both boys and girls. Ooh. This is the beginning of what we call social at least the argument for social democracy. Thomas Paine is the godfather of social security and social democracy. So he's not only the prophet of democracy, he's literally going beyond civil and political democracy and envisioning social and economic democracy. Well, here he is, he's, he's for abolition, he's for suffrage, and he's for distributing uh, the wealth uh, equitably uh, our, our social security. Or at least, let's put it this way. He wants to fight poverty amongst the elderly, and he wants to give young people a chance to avoid poverty. So this is the blueprint for the New Deal then, basically. Uh, in a way, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, that's why I call it. A, it's a blueprint for social democracy. Right. And I, I know FDR was high on him, and maybe was, was he directly influenced by reading pain and, and agrarian justice? I can't, that, we don't know if that's true or not. Lincoln... Lincoln read Paine, and I think I think Lincoln and his generation was influenced by Paine. I think, for, you know, I, I have little doubt about that. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a little book, as long as you have the video, let me just show people. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a book around 1939, 1940, titled The Moral Basis of Democracy. Right. Among the people she mentions in this book is Thomas Paine. And she gives more pages to Thomas Paine than any other person in the book. You know, I think Frederick Douglass, uh, you know, mentions uh, Paine. I know that uh, Mark Twain was influenced by Mark Paine. Twain thought Thomas Paine was one of the three greatest people in human history. They say no Paine, no Twain is the uh, phrase. <laughs> so, I think you would subscribe to that. He in, the, in my book, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. The it's first right four here, folks, and that you can get it. I ran out. You uh, you sent me uh, about ten copies, and they they're all gone now. I gave them to a lot of people uh, that are very important uh, with your name inscribed. Uh, okay, so go get it. It's the best book I've read on pain. It, thank you. You can go where? Where can they get this online? Well, almost any look. If they go to Ferrar, look. If they go to Macmillan Books, which is the pub, the sort of publisher overall, there, there's a page for. If they type in or just type in in Google, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. Right. Or type in Harvey K. It's bound to pop up. And you look, I mean, you can get it at Barnes and Noble online. You can you can get it at the evil Amazon online. You oh, I, 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 I recommend Barnes and Noble, folks. If certainly. you go to McNally Jackson, you could probably order the, the New York Independent Bookstore. You could probably order it through them. Is it is it on Kindle, too? Yes, you can get it on Kindle, too. Okay. I recommend people 
get this book. It's just not about pain. Well, the first four All chapters the are the influence. And two that I want to mention first and foremost is Matthew Lyons and Jedediah Peck. Okay. Just look at the anecdotes that are in this book that are related to pain by Harvey JK. It is worth the read folks. Get this book. And yeah, uh, I want to just point out to people so they know the first four chapters about pain his life and labors. But my argument is, is that Thomas Paine is the real godfather of America. Right, right. And, and as I a consequence- disappointed in the direction that it uh, took for the right. next- And then I tell, and then for the other chapters, the other maybe five chapters, six chapters, I tell the, I retell the story of America by way of Thomas Paine's influence and legacy. Every radical movement every progressive movement in American history from the time of the revolution to the most recent look back to the revolution and laid claim to Thomas Paine as their hero and champion. Labor it was movement, true. civil What's rights that? movement, labor movement, civil every rights. Every single, every yeah. movement. Yes. Martin Luther King's favorite quote when he was feeling depressed was Paine's line, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. We got 30 seconds or 45 seconds left. Uh, give us um, some concluding uh, thoughts about the greatness, why you are obsessed with this man. And then we're going to- Okay, gonna Thomas Paine has been my hero since I was 10 years old because of my grandfather and his, his love of Thomas Paine. And I didn't, I didn't really become a Paine scholar until sometime in the 1990s, which for most people may be a long time ago, but for me, it was not a long time ago. And, and Paine is my hero because he recognized and articulated the America's revolutionary promise and the struggle for America that began then and continues today is a struggle ignited by Thomas Paine's words. Well, you got the final words in, if I may uh, quote the Lawrence O'Donnell. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Randy Credico. Uh, you've been listening uh, to uh, Randy Credico live on the fly with the great professor, from the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay, uh, author, um, the great uh, Harvey J.K. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Thank you. Look forward to continuing this discussion. See you next week. Here's some more, another version of Dancing to Thomas Paine's Bones. <laughs> See you next Monday. As I went out one evening, by a different discontent, I bumped straight into old Tom Payne as running down the road he went. He said, I can't stop right now, child. King George is after me. He'd have a rope around my throat and hang me on a liberty tree. And I will dance to Tom Payne's bones, dance to Tom Payne's They are peach to revolution. Let me say in my defense that all I did wherever I went was to talk a lot of common sense. Dance the Tom Payne's bones. Dance the Tom Payne's bones. Now dance in the old disputes I own to the rhythm of Tom Payne's bones. Dance the Tom Payne's bones. Dance the Tom Payne's bones. Now dance in the old disputes I own to the rhythm of Tom It said, this is the age of reason. These are the rights of man. Kick off religion and monarchy. It was written in Tom Paine's plan. And I will dance to Tom Paine's bones. Dance to Tom Paine's bones. Now dance in the oldest, but I hold to the rhythm of Tom Paine's